our next speaker. I consider her to be the most adventurous person I know. Whether she decides to go on a trip by herself and hike across Spain doing the Camino, whether she decides to star in a post-apocalyptic reality TV show, um, or whether she's just hanging out teaching me and some of our colleagues and friends a new software, she's always willing to try something new and really experience new, exciting frontiers. My friend, Cyan Proctor, who teaches geology at South Mountain Community College, is that adventurer. And she seeks out incredible opportunities where she could grow and translate that to her students' learning experiences. And you're going to learn about some of the things that she's done. And I think that you're going to be wowed and awed by what she has done to help her students. So please join me in welcoming my friend, Cyan Proctor. Thanks, Cy. Thank you, Lisa. That was easy. OK. <laughs> How do you follow that, right? I am going to talk to you about a professional growth opportunity that I had the opportunity to participate in this past summer. But before we do that, I want to ask you a question. Raise your hand if you ever thought about being an astronaut. So raise your hand. Let's see. So look around. You can see the people. Keep your hand up. Raise your hand. Now, those of you guys that have your hands raised, keep your hands raised. How many of you would go to Mars? Oh, OK. So there's a few of you. How many of you would go on a one-way trip to Mars? <laughs> if, you're standing next, if you're sitting next to a person who has their hands raised, you might want to slide away from them because <laughs> there's. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk to you about a Mars on Earth experience that I had this past summer called High Seas. And it took place on the big slope, uh, on the back side of the, uh, Mauna Loa, on the big island of Hawaii. I got to spend four months, that's 120 days, living and acting like I was on Mars. And this is a picture of the facility, the habitat, where it was located. It was at about 8,000 feet above sea level. Um, the reason why Hawaii was selected was because it's very Mars-like in its terrain. Uh, it, the habitat um, was just under 1,000 square feet, and there were six of us living in this habitat. And so let's take a look at the hab. And this is the design here. So if you look at this, it was a two-story geodesic dome. And so the bottom here is where we did most of our living and our activities. We had a kitchen. We had workspace on the outside. And then we had a meeting table where we ate all of our meals and we had our daily meetings. So that's here. We also had a bathroom with a shower. But we could only shower a couple of times a week. For There were two-minute showers, basically, that you could do a few times a week because water is going to be precious on Mars. And then we had a laboratory back here. On the second floor, we had our individual rooms. So this was my room right here for four months. The crew, the crew was an international crew. It was an amazing crew. Starting from left to right, our commander, Angelo, he's Belgian, um, and he's a TED fellow. Next to him is me. I was the education outreach officer. And that's one of the reasons that what I'm going to talk to you about is that unique role of what is an education outreach officer and what did I learn from the, this experience. Next to me is Jahira, and she was our science officer. Next to her is Oleg, and Oleg was our geologist, a USGS geologist, who actually works in Flagstaff. Next to him is Kate our science writer. So we actually had a science writer with us who blogged while we were in the Habitat. She blogged for The Economist and for Discover Magazine. And then next to her is Simon. Simon's Canadian, and he was our engineer, and he's a roboticist. So this was our crew for the four-month mission, 120 days. 
Now, when, you, when you're looking at our crew, a lot of you guys are thinking, you know, did we get along, you know, four months, isolated, and cooped up, we actually got along really well. The, the principal investigators did an amazing job of selecting a group of people who could live and work for four months together. And if you think about NASA, their job, if you're actually going to send somebody to Mars or a crew to Mars, you're talking about three years, a three-year trip. And so crew selection is extremely important for that process. They had over 700 people apply for this mission, and they chose us six. We had to meet the minimum, we had to meet the minimum qualifications to be a NASA astronaut. And so when you think about living in an environment, a small environment, 1,000 square feet, six individuals, four months, how are we going to get it long? What are the things that we're going to do on a daily basis? And so if we look at these pictures here, you can see that there's a lot going on here. We had meetings. Every day we had meals that we did. We exercised a lot because we had a NASA-funded uh, exercise program. We, um, this is Simon. He brought in a lot of engineering stuff. We had robotic pets that he brought in right here that we had to use as part of, because, you know, you can't bring your dog or your cat to Mars, so you want to have some kind of, like, robotic companion. We had movie night, and it was fun because we circulated through different movies. Everybody got to pick a movie uh, to watch, and so we, we circulated through the crew who got to pick which movie. Um, we had a lot of, like, just fun activities where we had parties and just playing games because you need some social entertainment during that time. We also got to go outside. But when you went outside, you had, you're living on Mars. So you can't go outside because the air, you can't breathe it. So we had to go outside wearing a spacesuit. And so the process, we call that an EVA. And so this is where the habitat was located. And over the four month period, we did about 50 EVAs to different parts of the, of the island, well not, the, too far on the island, but around the habitat. Because if you're going to send a crew to Mars, you're going to want them to explore the planet and, so, and to go out. And so that's what we had to do. This is Oleg right here. This is a terrific photo. What he's doing is he rigged a GoPro and on some line, and we're sending it down into this volcanic vent here to get video and to see what's down in this area. We also... On our EVAs, we did a lot of geology. Oleg here is prepping us for a geology mission, talking about the different rocks that we're going to see. There are a lot of skylights on the big island of Hawaii, but there's also a lot of skylights on Mars. And that's a situation where you have a lava tube, and after the lava, lava tube has solidified and has emptied out, the top has collapsed in, and it allows you to be able to go into that lava tube. And so we were looking at areas like that. As the education outreach officer, my job was to my job was to look at our mission and to disseminate information about our mission to the general public. And so one of my key roles was to be the photographer. So a lot of the pictures you see here are images that I've taken and some of the other crew members tr uh, to document what it was like to live and act like you're living on Mars for four months. Now, going out seems like it's a lot of fun, but it was also a lot of work to prepare to go out. So this is a picture of me getting one of the crew members ready to go out and to get into these suits. We actually had many different suits we were, task we were testing while we were on this mission. Science. Science was a big part of being on this mission. It, we had all kinds of research that came in. The crew had a lot of research that came in. And so Jahira here, the science officer, she was interested in microbial growth on textiles. And so one of the things that she brought in, she worked with NASA to bring in a textile study where we had to wear the same exercise outfit for as long as we could. Because when you go, when you, when you go on a space mission, you don't have... You can't bring a lot of clothes with you. And so you think about Star Trek. Did you ever wonder why they always wear the same suit every day? Because <laughs> they can't wash it, right? No, they don't have water. No, the reason why is if you're going to go to Mars, water is a precious commodity, and you're going to not be able to bring a lot of things with you. 
And so it was really interesting because we had to wear these uh, shirts every day and we had to work out for at least an hour in them. And I can tell you that there were two crew members who wore the same shirt for the whole four month, four month mission. <laughs> it wasn't me. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> I didn't miss any of my showers, and <laughs> it didn't take me long to go through my T-shirts. I'm like, I'm out of this. Uh, we also had a sleep study that was brought in by Kate, and so we wore these Zeos every night, and they monitored our sleep habits. Um, I'm going to talk about the food study that we did, but we had to do a lot of testing every single day surrounding the food. And so this is a nasal patency test that we're doing here. And so, and then we had odor ID. And so there was a lot of interesting science that was happening on a daily basis while we were in the habitat. And also, as the education outreach officer, it was my job to not only take pictures of all the things that were happening, but I wanted to learn and do interesting things with how I disseminated my information. And again, this is going out to the world. It's not just going out to my students. It's not just going out to friends and colleagues of my crew members. I had to think about how do I engage people from around the world in our mission, and especially kids in our mission. So this is one of the videos I put together. Greetings from Mars, I'm Dr. Proctor, and today I'm going to show you a world where STEM is full of action, adventure, mystery, and amazement. Are you ready? Let's go. Right now, I am living smack dab in the middle of a science experiment. It's called High Seas, and it's a simulated mission to Mars where we're testing out all kinds of scientific questions. How cool is that? Simon, you're the high seas engineer. I noticed that you are working on some modeling, wearing 3D glasses. What exactly are you doing? We have a 3D printer coming to the habitat and we're going to use it to print out parts that we might need. And I'm just practicing building these parts right now. That's really cool. Can I see what it looks like? Sure. Whoa! Wicked! That's cool. So can you build me a car? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Jahira, you are the high sea science officer. You brought in all these textiles for us to wear. What exactly are you looking for? I am looking for the organisms that live on our clothes. So you're saying that there are creatures living on our clothing. Yes, there are millions of bacteria growing on your clothes, including your socks. Wow, that's a lot. Is there anything we can do about it? Yes, we can do something about it. For example, these socks contain copper particles that will kill some of those organisms so that your feet don't get stinky. So you're saying that if I wear these socks, my feet won't smell anymore? They won't smell anymore. I am totally going to change right now. Yeah, give it a try. Hey Oleg, I have seen you around the habitat with this camera. What exactly are you doing? Well, I'm taking thermal images. What exactly does that mean? Well, that basically measures the amount of heat emitted by objects. That's really cool. So you're saying that if I got in front of this camera, you'd make me look hot? Well, we can give it a try. 98.6 degrees worth of hotness. Or 37 Celsius to be exact. Excellent. I'm having a blast, but you don't have to go to another planet to live in a world full of science, technology, engineering, and math. It's everywhere. I'm Dr. Proctor, and I've made a career out of science, technology, engineering, and math. Thank you for taking a look at my STEM world. Now let's go explore yours. So a lot of times people ask me, you know, how did I get this project or where did I even hear about this? Because my job, I'm a geologist. I teach geology at South Mountain Community College. Well, I got a Facebook email from a friend of mine. She posted this on my Facebook saying, you should apply for this because it deals with exploration and science 
I always wanted to be an astronaut. And the other thing was the main study for this project was food. And if you are a Facebook friend of mine, you know that I am a foodie. I post food pictures and recipes all the time. And so I was like, oh my God, food and space, I gotta do this. And so you might not know this, but astronauts right now, they suffer from food apathy when they're up in space for a long time. And so they get up there on the ISS and they just don't wanna eat anymore. Part of it is because of those, you know, ready-made meals that we saw smashed earlier by Todd. You know, who wants to eat that, right? And so NASA, when you think about long-duration space flight, three years, going to Mars. Because Mars has gravity, you can start thinking about cooking and doing interesting things. And so NASA really wants to deal with this subject of food apathy because of, for long duration, you don't want your astronauts losing weight over time. And also, the, there's a lot of things that go along with food and cooking and just the creativity that is involved. And so NASA, this study, we could eat two days like astronauts eat now, that means just add water and heat. And then we had two days of creative cooking where we could use shelf-stable ingredients. That means that we're using things like um, freeze-dried and dehydrated fruits, meats, and vegetables. Anything that can last on your pantry for more than three years, we could use. And so we could create, uh, had creative cooking two days, non-creative cooking two days, and we rotated through that cycle for 120 days. And so this is some, but we had some amazing cooks. I mean, this is some of the meals that we, we made. I mean, it was unbelievable. Oleg made ice cream. I know. I was like, yeah, it was really good. And so as the education outreach officer, what I wanted to do was I wanted to um, create a recipe contest so that the general public would get involved because we all love food. And these are images from the recipe contest. I had 25 recipes that during the four months, not only did I make with the crew and serve, but I ran a food, a food TV show from inside the hab that you could w weekly tune in and watch us make meals. And so this is an example of that. So I created these, and I, all by myself, as the education outreach officer in the Habitat, I edited, shot, edited, and posted them out to the population. Hello, Spain. and welcome back to Meals for Mars. I'm with Jahira, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Can't seem to get away from each other when it comes to cooking. And so today we've got Cajun style Spam Jambalaya by James Harris. So the Spam is back. You'll notice that the wok is out and we're gonna get sizzling in the hab. You ready to make some jambalaya? Sure, let's turn off the wok. Yeah, let's get this wok going so that we can uh, sizzle. So sizzling our Spam and then you're gonna add <laughs> in our ingredients. So Besides this is our just... Spam, what do we have? As this was just an example of, so 25 of these over the four month period. And I cooked with different crewmates during that time. And so it was really a great experience, but it kept the, the public engaged in what we were doing. Another thing that I did was I created the website, the High Seas website. And I'd never done that before, but not only did I create it, but I also had to put all of the information on the website. So how do you get the domain name? How do you do all of these things? I had to learn that. Um, the analytics, being able to track who's coming to the website and when they're coming. And so over time, we had 120,000 views to our website. And so I had to go into the analytics and learn all of this stuff. Facebook, another way that we put information out was through Facebook. A lot of people following it, but also looking at who those people were and why are they coming to our website. YouTube, big part of my dissemination program with all of these recipes and all of the other things that we were doing in the habitat. And, and being able to look at YouTube statistics again so that I can figure out who my audience is and what are they coming to see and where are they coming from. So because of the High Seas program, I was very fortunate that my next adventure is to go this summer, I'm going to spend four months, I mean not four months, four weeks in Alaska, Barrow, Alaska right here, as as one of the Polar Trek teachers. 
And so, and I know that one of the reasons, these things are very competitive. They're hard to get. I know one of the reasons why I got this was because of the work that I did with the High Seas Mission. And so what I want you to, to leave you with and I want you to think about is that even though I'm a geologist, I look for professional growth opportunities that are just unique and interesting that will help me grow in ways that I can come back and share these experiences with my students. So now I know how to video edit. I know how to post things on YouTube. I know how to create a website. I know how to do really interesting things that I never did before because of this professional growth opportunity. Thank you.